Uh, it's so great to be here. I love this uh, festival every year. Uh, Jamie Kabler and Helene Galen do a fantastic job. Thank all of you for being here. We have some longtime friends here, the Epsteins and the Golds, and I can go on and on. <laughs> Last year when I was the moderator, uh, we had people from our c condominium building on Wilshire Boulevard in Westwood. So <laughs> not quite that close this year. And my wonderful wife, Sharon Davis. So, um, so we're going to talk about uh, higher education, uh, why it's important to you, what it does beyond just educating your children, how it contributes to the economy. Uh, and we've got a very distinguished panel. Um, Max Nikias, I've known for 25 or 30 years. He was a great president of USC, President Emeritus. The rankings went up dramatically when he was president. Uh, he'll tell you all the doubling almost of the Pell Grant recipients under his watch. Uh, we're honored to have him. Uh, Jeff Cowan, who I've known almost my entire life. I've known his <laughs> wife, who I think is here even longer. Uh, they're great, great friends. He was, th I kid him, he's practicing downward mobility. I guess in some senses all of us are, but anyway, <laughs> downward mobility. Um, so he was the dean of the Annenberg School at USC. Then he was the dean of the Annenberg Estate, which is not far from here, where the president of China visited President Obama. And now almost every Chinese visitor wants to go to this estate and hopefully have a meeting there. Now he's a <coughs> professor, professor. So depending on your point of view, he's either experiencing upward mobility or downward mobility, but he's a terrific guy. And thank you for being here, Jeff. Uh, Bill Brands is a great storyteller, a great writer, uh, a wonderful history teacher at the University of Texas. He will share some very strong views on why we have public universities, what their original purpose was. Uh, w and what their purpose is uh, sort of morphed into today. So let me just begin with by a quick um, note on this whole admissions controversy that you've read about. First of all, it affects about one-tenth of one percent of the students all in athletic programs. So almost every university has some exception in their admissions process for athletes. Uh, the good news is that um, most of the coaches involved have been fired. Uh, almost every university, even those not in the controversy, um, have benefited from this story. And now the athletic program is no, no longer run by non-academics. They have two or three <coughs> academics that oversee every decision. The athletic um, folks, which used to have a sort of a separate backdoor to admissions, do. And so now, Ultimately, if you can't get past muster with the academic overseers, you're not admitted to the university. So the, the problem is on the backside now. You'll still read about it in the paper because it's kind of sensational, uh, and a lot of the people involved were famous people. But in terms of uh, writing the ship and making corrections, that problem is uh, largely in the rearview mirror. I mean, you may want to ask questions about it. You're happy to do that. But I just wanted to let you know we're not going to dwell on that today. So um, we're going to talk about research universities higher education. Um, let me start with, um, uh, with you, Max. Uh, tell me the changes and, and the progress that USC made during your tenure, what you're proudest of, uh, and if you had to do different, what, what, what would that be? Well, the, the proudest thing uh, that, that I can say, and I have been with USC for 28 years, 29 years, but uh, I was dean, uh, provost, and, and then president. Is, uh, is, it wasn't only the dramatic uh, ascent of the university in terms of academic quality, but also it's the diversity of the student body. Uh, 10 years ago, uh, only 10% of our undergraduate students were Pell Grant recipients. Uh, and now it's the 24%. Actually, among wow. all our private university peers, we rank number one in the wow. nation in Pell Grant recipients. Congratulations. So if you look at the class, the undergraduate class coming into USC, 20% is first generation to go to college, 25% is underrepresented minority, and there is uh, more than two thirds of our students receive a financial aid. Uh, and we have increased enormously to $350 million per year where the university provides financial aid to make the USC education affordable to students. And the other thing I'm very proud of is that we have increased the enrollment of transfer students 
from community colleges. Mm -hmm. Our private peers do not do that. And uh, yes, we cherry pick the best and the brightest who graduate from the community sure. colleges. You want to ensure that they can handle the coursework, and they do. But when they come to us, they're hungrier than never before in terms of succeeding academically. And actually, I have found over the years they become some of the most loyal alums because they never forget USC gave them the chance. Well, that segues into the next topic I wanted to uh, have our panelists speak to, which is you know, college affordability um, and what's being done and what's planned to be done to make education uh, more affordable. Um, and we'll also get to the purpose of higher education when we get to Bill Brand. So let me ask you, Jeff, in terms of what's, what's happening uh, at uh, public and private universities to make college more affordable. Uh, Max mentions um, the community colleges. So Governor Brown in his last year said if you're a full-time student at a community college like the College of the Desert, which by the way recently got several people into Berkeley, which is not too shabby, um, uh, the, and then uh, Gavin Newsom has made the second year free. So if you're a full-time student at a community college anywhere in this state, uh, you've reduced about half the cost of going to college when you begin to transfer. But, but there think, are a lot of other things that are well, done on well, college. Well, I just but I want to underline a little bit of what Max said. Now, this just happens to be USC, where I am, and we're both very proud of USC. But I get to teach a lot of these students. And, um, and I always ask students to write their first paper as an autobiography about themselves and their background. And it's so inspiring how many of them came from backgrounds where nobody in their family would ever have gone to, to, public, uh, to, to a great university. They hadn't been to universities. And I want to make one point about the, and this affordability issue, Gray, which is what you're talking about, is a huge issue. And it's a, it's a political issue. And, and it should be a political issue because it's a question of the, what role the government will play. It is. But... The, what Max also said that's true is right now community college is free. You can't get any more affordable than that. It's free. And then you can transfer from the community college to the UCs. And I, when I taught at UCLA, I had many community college students, and to, to, U, to USC. The fascinating thing to me about the admissions process is there's been a lot of talk about SATs. But the SATs are kind of a proxy to see how well you do in college. But the best proxy for how you, well you do in college is college. And so when USC, at least, looks at admissions of kids who are in community college, they don't ask what their SATs were. They don't care. They want to know how well they've done in community college. So Max is saying cherry picking. Well, it's cherry picking in that sense, but it's completely talent-based. Sure. It's It has nothing to do with your financial circumstances, and those, if you're rich, you probably weren't there to begin with. It, it has nothing to do with who you know. It, it, it is, I'm sure there's an effort to make it diverse, but it is incredible. I just want to add one other point, point of diversity, because I, I was so proud of this at USC. I don't know if this is true every year, and I hate to say it in the presence of a, of a great governor who had so much to do with the UC system becoming as, as great as it is, and I hope we'll get to talk about that later. But it was usually true, maybe always true, that the diversity of the student body in terms of racial and ethnic background was more diverse at USC than it was at the University of California system. And, and this is something when you read other criticisms of USC, and many of them are valid, but you don't read that. And as somebody who's a part of the journalism world, it's always been a disappointment to me that we don't have that part of the story, too. Well, you're part of the journalism world. So you <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, I bring it up as often as I can. I brought it up here. Yeah. A few journalists yeah. in the audience here. You can also write an article and write an op-ed. Yeah. But, but from, uh, from my experience, uh, the transfer students from community colleges, a great majority of them come from very challenging socioeconomic conditions. Yep. And we do offer them financial aid even for the remainder of their studies at USC. And another one which is against the conventional wisdom, uh, the truth is, is that they have exactly the same graduation rates with the rest of the university, wow. 92%. So let's um, um, talk for a second about uh, college debt. Um, when a lot of us went to school, we didn't have to worry about college debt or if it was a pittance compared to what it is now. Uh, I've, I've, long believed that we should find, it's in our national interest to find a way 
uh, for people to work off their college debt. So we have a few programs if you're a doctor and you want to practice in the Central Valley and rural areas, uh, we reduce your debt. But I, in the best of all worlds, I'd like to see a program where everybody works for at least three months. And maybe your debt is reduced 15% or 20%. And then if you want to, uh, and you'd be in a rural area or a hospital or um, be all kinds of options. Uh, Want to go in the military? I was in the Vietnam War. That's fine. But anything you wanted to do that's serving other human beings, trying to make their lives better, would qualify. Uh, everyone would do it for three months, and then if you want to do it another three months, that's 20 percent. Why is that in our? It's obviously in the students' interest, but why is that in our interest? Because people postpone family formation. They postpone buying a house because they have to pay off this student debt, which, by the way, the interest rate averages about seven or eight percent on that debt. So we got to do something on the back end. And if you don't like the idea of public service, maybe, um, uh, Bill, you could comment on that. But I'd also like you to speak about the, the historical purposes for higher education. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. I have, I've been in the field of education for essentially my entire adult life. And I attended a private university here in California. I attended Stanford. I taught at a private university for a while, Vanderbilt. But most of my time has been in the public university realm. I spent 17 years at teaching at Texas A&M in College Station, Texas. And I've been now 15 years at the University of Texas in Austin. So I'm going to speak primarily about the role of public higher education, which is a different thing, although increasingly similar to private higher education in terms of its funding model. But I'm going to start with when public universities began in this country in the 19th century. And they were originally the land-grant universities. And the idea was, and this is why so many of them are called A&Ms, agriculture and mechanical. These were higher education. They weren't called universities. They were nearly all colleges at first. And they were directed at providing practical education, practical scientific education. So farmers, so mechanics, the engineers, could learn the latest techniques. And so they could make a contribution to their own lives, to their communities, but also so they could be part of the engine of American economic development. And public university education remained extremely affordable through the 1960s and the 1970s. In fact, as uh, I think you said, as affordable as can be with the GI Bill, for example, after World War II. So vets could go to school for free, and they had their living expenses paid as well. And again, this philosophy that public Education, in this case, public higher education, is a public good persisted. And because it was a public good, it was a public good like dams and highways and infrastructure. Consider it intellectual infrastructure. And, the, and, and so, therefore, it deserved to be supported by the public. Even if your child didn't go to college, you benefited from the fact that this was a better educated economic system. This was a better, better educated citizenry. Things changed starting in about the 1980s. And part of it, part of it was the, the conservative shift in American politics generally. And the idea became, first of all, let's shrink the size of government. And so what has happened in nearly every state in the country is that the share of operating expenses of the public universities paid for by the state legislature, that is by taxpayers, has diminished, diminished drastically from probably about 40% in Texas where I teach to around 12% this most recent fiscal year. That money to pay for the education has to come from somewhere. And so it comes from increasingly students. I arrived at the University of Texas as a graduate student in 1981 and a year's tuition was something like $800. And now a year's tuition is around $12,000. It's still relatively affordable <clears throat> compared to private universities, but that is an enormous jump. So students are expected to pay that. It used to be the case that an enterprising student could work his or her way through college. You could work part-time, you could work summers, and at the end of your college career, you wouldn't be in debt. But when the, the tuition increased, then students began borrowing money. So with the result now that the average student who comes out of a public university having borrowed money has something like $28,000 in debt. 
So it really changes the model. Now, a challenge for public universities, if they still call themselves public universities, is to figure out how to get that back down, to make it affordable. And various things are being done. In Texas, there is a more a closer integration of the community college it was at the four-year college. We're talking about this. And so it's much more common for students to spend their first year or two years in a community college. Now, community college is not free in Texas, but it's cheap. And one of the things that makes it inexpensive is that in community colleges, most of the students of traditional student age, college age, live at home. So they don't incur the extra expenses of living in a dormitory, an apartment, or something like that. And so that makes, oh, and the other thing is that the, the Department of Higher Education in Texas has thoroughly integrated the curricula at the community colleges with the four-year universities. So you know exactly what courses are going to transfer and what credit you're going to get. That has made a big dent in this. Now, there's something, and I'm all for this. There is a more recent reform that I'm somewhat ambivalent about, and that is to start giving college credit to high school students for classes that they take in high schools. I have enormous respect for high school teachers. I was a high school teacher for 10 years before I started teaching at the college level. And I have enormous respect for my colleagues who teach high school. But my reservation has to do with what you can actually teach a 14 or 15 year old. I used to teach math and I taught history. And I can tell you that if you're a smart kid in math, you can learn calculus at 12, if you're smart, as well as you can learn it at 18. But you cannot learn history, which is the thing I teach. You cannot learn history at the age of 14 in the same way that you can at the age of 19. In fact, you can't learn history as well at 19 as you can at 65. <laughs> because it really is all about appreciating the human condition. So, I understand the motivation behind it because these students now, they pay nothing out of pocket and they arrive on my campus at the University of Texas and they've got a whole year's worth of college credit under their belts at no cost to them, at no cost to their parents. But the quality of the education is, as I said, with no disrespect to my high school teaching colleagues, it's simply not the same. So this is, this is the way we're trying to deal with it. Well, let me, uh, those are very interesting points. Let, let me throw out another argument. So this, uh, the millennials live their whole life on their phones. They shop, they buy, everything, entertainment, everything is on their phone. So they can't <coughs> understand why every university doesn't have some kind of online educational program for which they can get credit. Uh, now, Harvard has had an online degree for... 15, 20 years, and there are some private schools and maybe some public schools that do that. Obviously, um, you don't have to make all the courses online. I've often said uh, to professors in California, if you don't want to make, put your course online, don't put it online. But if you want to put it online, you can participate in some of the revenue, and your course will have a, you know, a broader reach. You'll affect more people. Um, it's just surprising to me how much resistance there is uh, in the educational community to, uh, at least public education, to uh, online programs. But it, obviously it could be used to reduce, further reduce the cost of education. Maybe you could make, in your major, let's say, you, I'm just making this up. In your major, you'd have to attend in person, but the uh, extra courses you were taking that don't go to your major, maybe you could take them online. There's a zillion ways you could, uh, you could divide the pie. Uh, I just want to see if there's some, uh, again, with an eye towards getting more people educated, which increases GDP. People do something with the money when they make money. Uh, obviously, they're philanthropic. They uh, support their kids. Uh, they invest in business. They hire people. The, the government tells me they pay taxes. I'm not part of the government anymore, but I think that's part of the process. So a lot of positive things happen when more people get educated. I can comment on that, uh, Governor, because I I gave a series of lectures in the UK last fall about the future of online education. And uh, what we're going to see in the next decade, in my opinion, is, uh, is the next revolution in the area of education. Uh, by the year 2030, families and their children are going to have many, many more choices in terms of how they would like to see their child being educated. And uh, the online colleges 
that uh, there will be non-profit and they will provide the quality of education are also going to be less expensive. So in other words, you're going to have to pay more if you would like your child to go to a university campus and also have the residential experience. But without the residential experience, then you'll be able to pursue an undergraduate degree or a graduate degree online and it will be much, much less expensive. And what is going to cause this new phase of revolution in online education is AI, artificial intelligence. Uh, there are so many business startups and so much investment in this area. Uh, to me, it's unprecedented and it's going to explode in the next decade. Does anyone else have well, I, well, I mean, I totally agree with this. And, and I was personally, for a long time, kind of resistant to the uh, idea. Let me ask you this. So, but are we going to have two classes of education, one that's online and one that's well, not well, online? I, I, or is that going to put I, some I pressure think, on the more traditional? Right, I think it will, it will be in, in ways you can't predict yet. But for yep. example, our daughter, who's pretty privileged, uh, is a grade school teacher. And she has two small children. She takes a class at Harvard. She has a graduate degree in education. But now she's stuck in California, if you want to say that. Right. I mean, we're happily there. But she's been taking an intense class at Harvard, a specialized class in education, and it's been fantastic for her. I think that this is going to become a very diverse thing in all kinds of ways. Don't you think, Max, that sure. people can't predict yet? And I don't know how much of it's happening at uh, UT Austin. I'm sure it is. So I have a couple of comments on this. One is that I think that Max is exactly right, that it is going to open this up to, it's going to open education up to people who don't want the traditional college experience. And maybe these are 18-year-olds who are going to stay home. It's more affordable to do it. But I see especially an opportunity for people who are 50 years old and they want to or they have to retool, mm -hmm. that the job they had isn't satisfactory, the job disappeared. And now they can do this without disrupting their lives. In my experience, I've been involved in programs that do distance education. And the most appreciative students, the ones who get the most out of it, are the ones who simply could not do this program if they had to move to my campus, if they had to give up their job, because this is stuff that you can usually do on your own time around whatever else you're doing. And I can tell you that these are the most dedicated students there are. When I taught in community colleges, I really appreciated my students probably more than the students I have now. I love my students now. But the students that I have now, the University of Texas is, is really hard to get into. It's very selective. And so the students who get in are ones who essentially you can't get into the University of Texas unless you're a straight A student in high school. And you have to take the right classes. But those students are all sort of really good students, and they've always expected to go to college. And so it's no big deal in their minds for them to go to college. But to get someone who wants to re-educate himself or herself 20 years after maybe missing college, and this is an opportunity. So that is a really, a really important deal. Now, there's a challenge to the existing world of higher education, and it has to do with What's the value of a college degree? And so, I mean, if I were president of Harvard, I would, I'm sure the president of Harvard is thinking very carefully about how many people you want to let into these online programs. Mm -hmm. Because one of the <coughs> measures of a Harvard degree, a Stanford degree, Princeton degree, USC degree, name it, is its scarcity value. And if everybody can get in, then it loses that part of it. But it's really going to put colleges and universities on their metal to be able to demonstrate what it is they teach. And so, you know, if you get into the right college, and we were talking about the admission scandal, well, there's great pressure to get into the right college because if you just tell people, I got into USC, I got into MIT, I got into whatever, that sticks with you because there's this brand of the seal of approval. And it's almost independent of what you actually learned when yeah, you were sure. there. And so I would love to see these online opportunities really upping the game of prestige universities so they can really demonstrate what value we add to the lives of our students. Well, if Bill, I... first of all, I want to congratulate you for going to Stanford. So now it's <laughs> two and two up here. We have an easy, easy <laughs> But let me, let me make one other point okay. and ask you a comment. So, uh, you know, I've been pushing this online education thing that Governor Brown did, the Board of Regents did, but academic senate doesn't want to hear anything about it. I'm talking about the University of California. Um, and the point I want to make is the flip side to everything. 
So online education will be an on-ramp for a lot of people who will be appreciative of the opportunity. They will succeed. They will be CEOs. They'll create jobs. That's great. The flip side is there's been so many problems with these online education. And as a veteran, I really resent how they take advantage of people coming out of the service. They have all their uh, GI Bill rights go, go to online education. And these people produce a very inferior product. Right. Uh, and they also take advantage of uh, people pretty far down the economic scale, just the exact right. people, if they're hardworking <coughs> and capable, we want to see succeed. Uh, get yeah. taken advantage of. So how do how does that get figured out? How do you get the benefit of online education without without the corruption and the? Okay. Uh, if I could tell you how I, I do it. So I teach a class, an introductory course in U.S. history every semester, and we started last week. And this is the half of the year that deals with American history from 1865, the end of the Civil War to the present. And this class is essentially half online and half in the classroom. And the online portion is the portion that I figured out that I can pretty well push online with no loss of quality. The students read a textbook, and I'm convinced of the quality of the textbook because I wrote it myself. <laughs> and, and they are examined <laughs> online on the material in the textbook. And furthermore, I can enforce deadlines on the students because the software is utterly un... It's unsympathetic. To, it doesn't accept any to excuses. You have to get it done by this time or you get no credit. As a result of this, in the classroom, I feel under no obligation to convey the information of the course. That's what they get in this online sure. textbook. And furthermore, I know my students, they're doing it. I can get right into their side of the, the story and I can see where they are, how many of them took it. And I can see that they have mastered the material informationally. So when they come into my classroom, I have a class of 500 students. But I conduct it as a discussion. It's not a lecture, it's a discussion. And they do writing exercises for me. We have a discussion. I could not do this without the technology of, as I say, so this is a half online course. And that's the way, that's why I'm doing it. Other people do it other ways. Max, I know All you my courses I have taught at USC the last 30 years, they were all online with the exception the classics one I did as president of a university. And it was exactly the same lecture that you broadcast live all the students in an asynchronous mode, they could download and watch the lecture again and again. And I have students in class and also have students from all over the country uh, uh, taking the class. So this way, if you do it this way, you do not compromise the quality of the instruction and the, and the material. Going back to your comment, uh, Governor, about uh, uh, what happened with the online colleges, that they took advantage of a lot of our students. Uh, those colleges, they were for profit, and they had no admissions criteria. They, uh, uh, their graduation rates, uh, they were anywhere between 30 to 40%. And uh, all these students, they were getting student loans, and uh, the default rate of the student loans for those for-profit colleges was 50%, when for everybody else, including the research universities, was less than 2%. So, uh, and that's why the Obama administration uh, really went after them and regulated them. All right. So let me switch here slightly. Um, First of all, I'm sure, uh, would you raise your hand if, you, if you're a resident of California? Okay. Um, I want uh, you to learn something that I learned from Alan Greenspan. I was the governor of California in 99, 2000, and he always wanted me to have him visit at the Federal Reserve where he was a chairman. Uh, um, and so my family still lived on the East Coast, and on the way back, we went to, Sharon and I went to Washington, and we spent about four hours with uh, Alan Greenspan, because it was a holiday, it was the day after Christmas, and um, he was, I, I, I was trying to get some assistance on the energy crisis, he said, I can't really help you there, Governor, but I don't want you to feel sorry for yourself, because you have something no one else has. You have far more research universities than any other state. I just assume Massachusetts had more than we did. So, oh, no, no. You have then 12, now 13. 10 are, 10 are the UC campuses. 
uh, Caltech, Stanford, and USC are the other three. Massachusetts has seven. No other state has more than five. Now, why am I telling you this? Because just the UC system, forget Stanford, Caltech, and um, uh, USC for a second. Just the 10 campuses generate four times as many patents every year as do all the private and public universities of every other state, which is not Massachusetts, it's New York. So we are a idea and patent factory, and all that leads to startups and to jobs. And I don't know if you've been looking lately, but the last two, three, four months, California has been, actually for the last couple of years, greatly outperforming the rest of the nation in terms of job growth and GDP. And in terms of taxes, I would say, and, and that's why we're the home of Google, Apple, Facebook, because they need to be close to research universities and they need graduates coming out of those universities that are capable employees. And what does that mean in terms of revenue? I would say 40% of our taxes come from the technology, life sciences, uh, industry broadly viewed in terms of venture capitalists and all the uh, supporting companies. Well, that's money goes in the same pot that supports public schools, transportation, mental health programs, everything else. So it's a, re it's a real economic upside to have those universities uh, in California. And I, I, go ahead. No, go ahead. Well, I just, Mike Papeo was Secretary of State, of course, and you might not think he was thrilled with higher education. But he had a meeting two weeks ago, I think, with the presidents and provosts of the major California universities, public and private. And he made the point, and understands the point, that the growth, um, the growth in American economy comes out of exactly this in gray. When you had right. a surplus at one time, you gave $100 million to several different universities, right. totally transformed them to become great research universities. Max started his career in large part, his, his famous career, by having a, a major research uh, uh, a lab. Um, but Papeo saw this. And why was he meeting with the university presidents? Because he's afraid somebody else will steal it, right. specifically China. Um, and there are all kinds of thefts. It's not uh, necessarily illegal thefts, but there are things that could be made much more difficult for them. And I think that that element of the American economy that higher education provides is so important, and although Papeo thought it, which I understand so I think is great, I don't think it's fully appreciated by those people yeah. who fund education. Our uh, top research universities uh, take the AAU club of the top 62 research universities. It is still the envy of the world. Oh, there's no question. The best and the brightest from all over the globe. I live a breath with it. I see the, I've, I've been seeing the applications throughout my career. Everybody wants to come and get a degree, the best and the brightest from all over the world, from one of these universities. And not just an undergraduate degree, also masters and PhDs. And we graduate uh, more than 85% of the PhDs in the country. And uh, this is the human capital that contributes to this economic growth of the nation. And I can share a little bit of story with you uh, since we have Bill from Texas. I got to know very well the uh, current governor of Texas, Greg Abbott, because a little secret, he was a USC dad. His daughter uh -huh. started there. Okay. <coughs> and this is what he shared with me one day. Uh, he shared with me a study that he had his own analysts do, that after the 2008 economic crisis, the state in, Cali in, in the United States that has the fastest economic growth, and very quickly, was California. And he asked his people to do the analysis, why? Why California and not Texas or anybody else? And the conclusion was exactly what you said earlier, Governor. It was our research universities in California, the students that we graduate, I got news for you, and I'll be telling parents all my life, when your sons or daughters graduate from our universities, they do not want to leave the state. <laughs> and they contribute greatly to the economic growth. So let me tell you a story about um, uh, um, the, the, these $100 million grants. So in the dot-com boom, we had a lot of money, and I wanted to spend some of it on capital improvements. So I said, let's, uh, and I actually got this fellow from, idea from Richard Lerner, who was the head of the Scripps Research Institute in, in near San Diego. Um, so we had a competition to see which of the public universities could, uh, would win this uh, grant, and they all 
linked up with two or three other universities. But the UC systems did not want to choose. They didn't want to choose between a UCLA and a UC San Diego and a UC Riverside and a UC Berkeley. So your predecessor, Steve Sample, David Baltimore, who was the president of Caltech, was a Nobel Prize winner, John Hennessy, who ran Stanford, and Richard Lerner were the honorees, or not the honorees, were the, they, they were the deciders. So the legislation which I proposed and signed said there would be three grants of $100 million each. The, these four people called me up, I just mentioned, the, the admissions committee, for lack of a better term. Uh, and they said, we have good news and bad, Governor. What? Give me the good news. Uh, the good news is we've picked three, and here they are. I said, well, what's the bad news? And they said, well, Berkeley is not one of them. <laughs> I said, well, kick one out and put Berkeley in. <laughs> no, no, no. We can't do that, Governor. You have to go back and get another $100 million. So. But the one that's been the most successful, we have the Qualcomm Institute of San Diego. When people come from Tokyo, to your, right. uh, they come from uh, Saudi Arabia, they come from uh, Europe to see if they have the innovation gene. They decide they do not, and they invest in that research. Uh, the Nanosystem Institute at UCLA, apropos of China, the science advisor to President Xi of China spent eight months there trying to learn and, you know, appropriate, I don't want to say steal, but, uh, you know, anything he could so they can copy it in China. But the, and they've all done very well. But the real home run is the Quantitative Biosciences Three Institute, which is in uh, Mission Bay, San Francisco. This used to be, there's a person attending this name, Nelson Rising, used to be the president of uh, a company I'm forgetting, but it owned an old railroad, uh, rights an old railroad track, it was unused, Nothing going on there, to no property value at all. And so we converted all that land, uh, built an institute. Um, Genentech built a spectacular institute right next to us. These are like six floory buildings. I don't, six floory, I don't mean two people, like 200 people working. All kinds, the Goldsmith Institute, Bayer Aspen has an institute. Uh, um, that is now ranked number two, right behind Harvard and MIT. And it wasn't really built until 2008, 2009. Um, but so th now, all these discoveries in the life, oh, so now that area is ranked number two, and San Diego, because of UC San Diego, Salk sure. and Scripps down there, is ranked number three in the nation. So two of the three centers of life science activity are here in California, benefiting from our research universities and contributing to our economy. So sure. education affects your lives in ways you may or may not have been aware of. Yeah. Um, I want to ask if anyone knows, we have six minutes and 30 seconds, and I've been told the ultimate penalty here is when they turn off your sound, <laughs> which is one minute after those six minutes expire. So does anyone else want to make another comment? If not, I'm going to go to questions. So. I just want to touch on one thing, because it's, it's a sub-theme of this conference. I mean, I think one thing you all notice by being here is the incredible, not just intellectual diversity of people who are here, but political diversity. And in my view, one of the most important things in university education, and it's not easy, is to be politically willing to, to embrace people who do challenge your ideas politically. And it's not easy, uh, but it's extremely important. It's not always done well. I can give plenty of examples of times it has happened. We talked before about the fact that the chairman of the philosophy department at uh, USC, it may surprise people here to know, was a strong Donald Trump supporter. And I think it is extremely important for universities to have that kind of diversity. And the reason for it is not only that you shouldn't leave people out, but because you never know where the great ideas are going to come from. Right. And if you have somebody who disagrees with you, if they do it in the way in which you want, it forces you to defend your own ideas and to have your own ideas grow. That's when education should be up, in my opinion. So I just want to throw that into the mix. As a historian, I will say that the, the greatest ideas in history always started out as heresy to some orthodoxy. And if there's any place in our society where heresy ought to be protected, it should be universities. Because with hindsight, we can tell that that old orthodoxy had some serious shortcomings and that the heresy was, okay, it was due to come along. But at the present, it's, it's always impossible. So, when I teach my students, I teach American history, as I said, and there are things that our predecessors did that none of us today would be proud of. Uh, the United States countenanced slavery for 400 years, and no one would defend slavery. So I ask my, but I will t I tell my students that at the time, it was 
This was the way the world worked. So I asked my students to ask themselves what we are doing today that their grandchildren are going to groan at and say, how could you do that? And sometimes this is a difficult conversation to have because it does get at issues that are loaded with values. But the students, on the whole, really value it. And if they, if they see that, we, you know, there's talk of safe spaces on universities. Well, if they see that there's a safe space to, to air their opinions, and they're not going to be judged, they're not going to be disqualified or canceled as the basis of this, then it is, this is what colleges are supposed to do. So I endorse exactly what you said. I'm going to just give a compliment to Texas, and we'll have a couple of minutes for questions. So we borrowed from Texas an idea that came out of a, a lawsuit in Texas that the top 10% of every high school in California will be admitted to some UC campus. There's 10 UC campuses. So th that means if I'm in East Palo Alto or if I'm in Watts, or parts of Hunter, Hunter's Point, or parts of uh, Sacramento um, that are mostly minority schools, I am going to get admitted to uh, uh, a major research university. Uh, it also forces those schools to take the courses that, that UC insists on, mostly um, uh, AP, advanced placement courses. Now, in the Central Valley, we found out there was like 10 school districts had never offered one advanced placement course. So now that the top 10% of that class can go to the UC, they have to offer advanced placement courses. We had little programs to rally all the parents to make sure that happened. Every other student in those uh, high schools in the Central Valley benefit from the availability of advanced placement classes. So let me stop there. We have two minutes. I think we probably have time for uh, two, maybe three questions. Uh, I'm going to start on the aisle. Yes, sir. Max? Uh, there are several reasons for that, but I have. Can you restate the question? Oh, I'm sorry, why the student debt has reached $1.5, $1.6 trillion. And I said there are many reasons for that. However, the increase of tuition is not the main reason. 25 years ago, there were 10 million students pursuing degrees at colleges and universities across the United States. Today, the number is 23, 24 million. In other words, the number of people, of students who want to go to college has increased enormously. And uh, in my opinion, this is going to become no different, it's already becoming, than healthcare. If I get sick and I have, God forbid, a serious illness, I expect to be treated and I don't care who pays for it. I'm entitled to get a first class education because I'm a citizen of the country and therefore I don't care who pays for it. So in other words, it's becoming an entitlement like healthcare, which by the way, it's a great thing because education is the greatest equalizer of society. The second reason that it became 1.5, 1.6 trillion is because more and more just getting one degree is not enough. And therefore, you have to pursue a master's degree or probably throughout your career or changing jobs in many different careers, you have to go back to school and uh, get a master's degree again and again and again. So we have many, many more students now who pursue graduate degrees. And, uh, and of course, they borrow to pay for the tuition. So those are the two main reasons of the increase. Unfortunately, our... Um our time has run out, but we really enjoyed this experience. Please give our panel a, uh, a nice round of applause.